Section fifty four of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book nine. The Preliminary Investigation. Chapter one. The Beginning of Perhotin's Official Career. Pyotr Ilyitch Perhotin, whom we left knocking at the strong locked gates of the widow Morozov's house, ended of course by making himself heard fenya who was still excited by the fright she had had two hours before and too much upset to go to bed was almost frightened into hysterics on hearing the furious knocking at the gate though she had herself seen him drive away she fancied that it must be dmitri fyodorovitch knocking again no one else could knock so savagely she ran to the house-porter who had already waked up and gone out to the gate and began imploring him not to open it but having questioned pyotr ilyitch and learned that he wanted to see fenya on very important business the man made up his mind at last to open pyotr ilyitch was admitted into fenya's kitchen but the girl begged him to allow the house-porter to be present because of her misgivings he began questioning her and at once learnt the most vital fact that is that when dmitri fyodorovitch had run out to look for grushenka he had snatched up a pestle from the mortar and that when he returned the pestle was not with him and his hands were smeared with blood and the blood was simply flowing dripping from him dripping fenya kept exclaiming this horrible detail was simply the product of her disordered imagination but although not dripping pyotr ilyitch had himself seen those hands stained with blood and had helped to wash them moreover the question he had to decide was not how soon the blood had dried but where dmitri fyodorovitch had run with the pestle or rather whether it really was to fyodor pavlovitch's and how he could satisfactorily ascertain pyotr ilyitch persisted in returning to this point and though he found out nothing conclusive yet he carried away a conviction that dmitri fyodorovitch could have gone nowhere but to his father's house and that therefore something must have happened there and when he came back fenya added with excitement i told him the whole story and then i began asking him why have you got blood on your hands dmitri fyodorovitch and he answered that that was human blood and that he had just killed some one he confessed it all to me and suddenly ran off like a madman i sat down and began thinking where's he run off to now like a madman he'll go to macro i thought and kill my mistress there i ran out to beg him not to kill her i was running to his lodgings but i looked at plotnikoff's shop and saw him just setting off and there was no blood on his hands then fenya had noticed this and remembered it fenya's old grandmother confirmed her evidence as far as she was capable after asking some further questions pyotr ilyitch left the house even more upset and uneasy than he had been when he entered it the most direct and the easiest thing for him to do would have been to go straight to fyodor pavlovitch's to find out whether anything had happened there and if so what and only to go to the police captain as pyotr ilyitch firmly intended doing when he had satisfied himself of the fact but the night was dark fyodor pavlovitch's gates were strong and he would have to knock again his acquaintance with fyodor pavlovitch was of the slightest and what if after he had been knocking they opened to him and nothing had happened then fyodor pavlovitch in his jeering way would go telling the story all over the town how a stranger called perhotin had broken in upon him at midnight to ask if any one had killed him it would make a scandal and scandal was what pyotr ilyitch dreaded more than anything in the world yet the feeling that possessed him was so strong that though he stamped his foot angrily and swore at himself he set off again not to fyodor pavlovitch's but to madame holikoff's he decided that if she denied having just given dmitri fyodorovitch three thousand roubles he would go straight to the police captain but if she admitted having given him the money he would go home and let the matter rest till next morning 
it is of course perfectly evident that there was even more likelihood of causing scandal by going at eleven o'clock at night to a fashionable lady a complete stranger and perhaps rousing her from her bed to ask her an amazing question than by going to fyodor pavlovitch but that is just how it is sometimes especially in cases like the present one with the decisions of the most precise and phlegmatic people Pyotr Ilyitch was by no means phlegmatic at that moment. He remembered all his life how a haunting uneasiness gradually gained possession of him, growing more and more painful and driving him on against his will. Yet he kept cursing himself, of course, all the way for going to this lady, but I will get to the bottom of it, I will he repeated for the tenth time grinding his teeth and he carried out his intention it was exactly eleven o'clock when he entered madame holakoff's house he was admitted into the yard pretty quickly but in response to his inquiry whether the lady was still up the porter could give no answer except that she was usually in bed by that time ask at the top of the stairs if the lady wants to receive you she'll receive you if she won't she won't pyotr ilyitch went up but did not find things so easy here the footman was unwilling to take in his name but finally called a maid pyotr ilyitch politely but insistently begged her to inform her lady that an official living in the town called perhotin had called on particular business and that if it were not of the greatest importance he would not have ventured to come tell her in those words in those words exactly he asked the girl she went away he remained waiting in the entry madame holikoff herself was already in her bedroom though not yet asleep she had felt upset ever since mitch's visit and had a presentiment that she would not get through the night without the sick headache which always with her followed such excitement she was surprised on hearing the announcement from the maid she irritably declined to see him however though the unexpected visit at such an hour of an official living in the town who was a total stranger roused her feminine curiosity intensely but this time pyotr ilyitch was as obstinate as a mule he begged the maid most earnestly to take another message in these very words that he had come on business of the greatest importance and that madame holikoff might have cause to regret it later if she refused to see him now i plunged headlong he described it afterwards the maid gazing at him in amazement went to take his message again madame holikoff was impressed she thought a little asked what he looked like and learned that he was very well dressed young and so polite we may note parenthetically that pyotr ilyitch was a rather good-looking young man and well aware of the fact madame holikoff made up her mind to see him she was in her dressing-gown and slippers but she flung a black shawl over her shoulders the official was asked to walk into the drawing-room the very room in which mitya had been received shortly before the lady came to meet her visitor with a sternly inquiring countenance and without asking him to sit down began at once with the question what do you want i have ventured to disturb you madam on a matter concerning our common acquaintance dmitri fyodorovitch karamazov perhotin began but he had hardly uttered the name when the lady's face showed signs of acute irritation she almost shrieked and interrupted him in a fury how much longer am i to be worried by that awful man she cried hysterically how dare you sir how could you venture to disturb a lady who is a stranger to you in her own house at such an hour and to force yourself upon her to talk of a man who came here to this very drawing-room only three hours ago to murder me and went stamping out of the room as no one would go out of a decent house let me tell you sir that i shall lodge a complaint against you that i will not let it pass kindly leave me at once i am a mother i i murder then he tried to murder you too why has he killed somebody else madame holikoff asked impulsively 
if you would kindly listen madam for half a moment i'll explain it all in a couple of words answered perhotin firmly at five o'clock this afternoon dmitri fyodorovitch borrowed ten roubles from me and i know for a fact he had no money yet at nine o'clock he came to see me with a bundle of hundred rouble notes in his hand about two or three thousand roubles his hands and face were all covered with blood and he looked like a madman when i asked him where he had got so much money he answered that he had just received it from you that you had given him a sum of three thousand to go to the gold mines madame holikoff's face assumed an expression of intense and painful excitement good god he must have killed his old father she cried clasping her hands i have never given him money never oh run run don't say another word save the old man run to his father run excuse me madam then you did not give him money you remember for a fact that you did not give him any money no i didn't i didn't i refused to give it him for he could not appreciate it he ran out in a fury stamping he rushed at me but i slipped away and let me tell you as i wish to hide nothing from you now that he positively spat at me can you fancy that but why are we standing ah sit down excuse me i or better run run you must run and save the poor old man from an awful death but if he has killed him already ah good heavens yes then what are we to do now what do you think we must do now meantime she had made pyotr ilyitch sit down and sat down herself facing him briefly but fairly clearly pyotr ilyitch told her the history of the affair that part of it at least which he had himself witnessed he described too his visit to fenya and told her about the pestle all these details produced an overwhelming effect on the distracted lady who kept uttering shrieks and covering her face with her hands would you believe it i foresaw all this i have that special faculty whatever i imagine comes to pass and how often i've looked at that awful man and always thought that man will end by murdering me and now it's happened that is if he hasn't murdered me but only his own father it's only because the finger of god preserved me and what's more he was ashamed to murder me because in this very place i put the holy icon from the relics of the holy martyr saint varvara on his neck and to think how near i was to death at that minute i went close up to him and he stretched out his neck to me do you know pyotr ilyitch I think you said your name was Pyotr Ilyitch. I don't believe in miracles, but that icon, and this unmistakable miracle with me now, that shakes me, and I'm ready to believe in anything you like. Have you heard about Father Zasima? But I don't know what I'm saying. And only fancy, with the icon on his neck, he spat at me. He only spat, it's true, he didn't murder me, and he dashed away but what shall we do what must we do now what do you think pyotr ilyitch got up and announced that he was going straight to the police captain to tell him all about it and leave him to do what he thought fit oh he's an excellent man excellent mihail makarovitch i know him of course he's the person to go to how practical you are pyotr ilyitch how well you've thought of everything i should never have thought of it in your place especially as i know the police captain very well too observed pyotr ilyitch who still continued to stand and was obviously anxious to escape as quickly as possible from the impulsive lady who would not let him say good-bye and go away and be sure be sure she prattled on to come back and tell me what you see there and what you find out what comes to light how they'll try him and what he's condemned to tell me we have no capital punishment have we but be sure to come even if it's at three o'clock at night at four at half-past four tell them to wake me to wake me to shake me if i don't get up but good heavens i shan't sleep but wait hadn't i better come with you N no 
but if you would write three lines with your own hand stating that you did not give dmitri fyodorovitch money it might perhaps be of use in case it's needed to be sure madame holikoff skipped delighted to her bureau and you know i'm simply struck amazed at your resourcefulness your good sense in such affairs are you in the service here i'm delighted to think that you're in the service here and still speaking she scribbled on half a sheet of note-paper the following lines i've never in my life lent to that unhappy man dmitri fyodorovitch karamazov for in spite of all he is unhappy three thousand roubles to-day i've never given him money never that i swear by all that's holy k holikoff here's the note she turned quickly to pyotr ilyitch go save him it's a noble deed on your part and she made the sign of the cross three times over him she ran out to accompany him to the passage how grateful i am to you you can't think how grateful i am to you for having come to me first how is it i haven't met you before i shall feel flattered at seeing you at my house in the future how delightful it is that you are living here such precision such practical ability they must appreciate you they must understand you if there's anything i can do believe me oh i love young people i'm in love with young people the younger generation are the one prop of our suffering country her one hope oh go go but pyotr ilyitch had already run away or she would not have let him go so soon yet madame holikoff had made a rather agreeable impression on him which had somewhat softened his anxiety at being drawn into such an unpleasant affair tastes differ as we all know she's by no means so elderly he thought feeling pleased on the contrary i should have taken her for her daughter as for madame holikoff she was simply enchanted by the young man such sense such exactness in so young a man in our day and all that with such manners and appearance people say the young people of to-day are no good for anything but here's an example etc so she simply forgot this dreadful affair and it was only as she was getting into bed that suddenly recalling how near death she had been she exclaimed ah it is awful awful but she fell at once into a sound sweet sleep i would not however have dwelt on such trivial and irrelevant details if this eccentric meeting of the young official with the by no means elderly widow had not subsequently turned out to be the foundation of the whole career of that practical and precise young man his story is remembered to this day with amazement in our town and i shall perhaps have something to say about it when i have finished my long history of the brothers karamazov end of section fifty four section fifty five of the brothers karamazov by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary book nine chapter two the alarm our police captain mihail makarovitch makarov a retired lieutenant colonel was a widower and an excellent man he had only come to us three years previously but had won general esteem chiefly because he knew how to keep society together he was never without visitors and could not have got on without them some one or other was always dining with him he never sat down to table without guests he gave regular dinners too on all sorts of occasions sometimes most surprising ones though the fare was not recherche it was abundant the fish pies were excellent and the wine made up in quantity for what it lacked in quality the first room his guests entered was a well-fitted billiard-room with pictures of english racehorses in black frames on the walls an essential decoration as we all know for a bachelor's billiard-room 
there was card-playing every evening at his house if only at one table but at frequent intervals all the society of our town with the mamas and young ladies assembled at his house to dance though mihail makarovitch was a widower he did not live alone his widowed daughter lived with him with her two unmarried daughters grown-up girls who had finished their education they were of agreeable appearance and lively character and though everyone knew they would have no dowry they attracted all the young men of fashion to their grandfather's house mihail makarovitch was by no means very efficient in his work though he performed his duties no worse than many others to speak plainly he was a man of rather narrow education his understanding of the limits of his administrative power could not always be relied upon it was not so much that he failed to grasp certain reforms enacted during the present reign as that he made conspicuous blunders in his interpretation of them this was not from any special lack of intelligence but from carelessness for he was always in too great a hurry to go into the subject i have the heart of a soldier rather than of a civilian he used to say of himself he had not even formed a definite idea of the fundamental principles of the reforms connected with the emancipation of the serfs and only picked it up so to speak from year to year involuntarily increasing his knowledge by practice and yet he was himself a landowner pyotr ilyitch knew for certain that he would meet some of mihail makarovitch's visitors there that evening but he didn't know which as it happened at that moment the prosecutor and varvinsky our district doctor a young man who had only just come to us from petersburg after taking a brilliant degree at the academy of medicine were playing whist at the police captains ippolit kirillevitch the prosecutor he was really the deputy prosecutor but we always called him the prosecutor was rather a peculiar man of about five-and-thirty inclined to be consumptive and married to a fat and childless woman he was vain and irritable though he had a good intellect and even a kind heart it seemed that all that was wrong with him was that he had a better opinion of himself than his ability warranted and that made him seem constantly uneasy he had moreover certain higher even artistic leanings towards psychology for instance a special study of the human heart a special knowledge of the criminal and his crime he cherished a grievance on this ground considering that he had been passed over in the service and being firmly persuaded that in higher spheres he had not been properly appreciated and had enemies in gloomy moments he even threatened to give up his post and practice as a barrister in criminal cases the unexpected karamazov case agitated him profoundly it was a case that might well be talked about all over russia but i am anticipating nikolai parfenovitch nelyudov the young investigating lawyer who had only come from petersburg two months before was sitting in the next room with the young ladies people talked about it afterwards and wondered that all the gentlemen should as though intentionally on the evening of the crime have been gathered together at the house of the executive authority yet it was perfectly simple and happened quite naturally Ippolit Kirillevitch's wife had had toothache for the last two days, and he was obliged to go out to escape from her groans. The doctor, from the very nature of his being, could not spend an evening except at cards. Nikolai Parfenovitch Nelyudov had been intending for three days past to drop in that evening at Mihail Makarovitch's, so to speak, casually, so as slyly to startle the eldest granddaughter, Olga Mihailovna, by showing that he knew her secret, that he knew it was her birthday, and that she was trying to conceal it on purpose, so as not to be obliged to give a dance he anticipated a great deal of merriment many playful jests about her age and her being afraid to reveal it about his knowing her secret and telling everybody and so on 
the charming young man was a great adept at such teasing the ladies had christened him the naughty man and he seemed to be delighted at the name he was extremely well-bred however of good family education and feelings and though leading a life of pleasure his sallies were always innocent and in good taste he was short and delicate-looking on his white slender little fingers he always wore a number of big glittering rings when he was engaged in his official duties he always became extraordinarily grave as though realizing his position and the sanctity of the obligations laid upon him he had a special gift for mystifying murderers and other criminals of the peasant class during interrogation and if he did not win their respect he certainly succeeded in arousing their wonder pyotr ilitch was simply dumbfounded when he went into the police captains he saw instantly that every one knew they had positively thrown down their cards all were standing up and talking even nikolai parfenovitch had left the young ladies and run in looking strenuous and ready for action pyotr ilyitch was met with the astounding news that old fyodor pavlovitch really had been murdered that evening in his own house murdered and robbed the news had only just reached them in the following manner marfa ignatyevna the wife of old grigory who had been knocked senseless near the fence was sleeping soundly in her bed and might well have slept till morning after the draught she had taken but all of a sudden she waked up no doubt roused by a fearful epileptic scream from smerdyakov who was lying in the next room unconscious that scream always preceded his fits and always terrified and upset marfa ignatyevna she could never get accustomed to it she jumped up and ran half away to smerdyakov's room but it was dark there and she could only hear the invalid beginning to gasp and struggle then marfa ignatyevna herself screamed out and was going to call her husband but suddenly realized that when she had got up he was not beside her in bed she ran back to the bedstead and began groping with her hands but the bed was really empty then he must have gone out where she ran to the steps and timidly called him she got no answer of course but she caught the sound of groans far away in the garden in the darkness she listened the groans were repeated and it was evident they came from the garden good lord just as it was with lizaveta smerdyaschaya she thought distractedly she went timidly down the steps and saw that the gate into the garden was open he must be out there poor dear she thought she went up to the gate and all at once she distinctly heard grigory calling her by name marfa marfa in a weak moaning dreadful voice lord preserve us from harm marfa ignatyevna murmured and ran towards the voice and that was how she found grigory but she found him not by the fence where he had been knocked down but about twenty paces off it appeared later that he had crawled away on coming to himself and probably had been a long time getting so far losing consciousness several times she noticed at once that he was covered with blood and screamed at the top of her voice grigory was muttering incoherently he has murdered his father murdered why scream silly run fetch some one but marfa continued screaming and seeing that her master's window was open and that there was a candle alight in the window she ran there and began calling fyodor pavlovitch but peeping in at the window she saw a fearful sight her master was lying on his back motionless on the floor his light-coloured dressing-gown and white shirt were soaked with blood the candle on the table brightly lighted up the blood and the motionless dead face of fyodor pavlovitch terror-stricken marfa rushed away from the window ran out of the garden drew the bolt of the big gate and ran headlong by the back way to the neighbour marya kondrachevna both mother and daughter were asleep but they waked up at marfa's desperate and persistent screaming and knocking at the shutter 
martha shrieking and screaming incoherently managed to tell them the main fact and to beg for assistance it happened that foma had come back from his wanderings and was staying the night with them they got him up immediately and all three ran to the scene of the crime on the way marya kondrachevna remembered that at about eight o'clock she heard a dreadful scream from their garden and this was no doubt grigory's scream parricide uttered when he caught hold of mitya's leg some one screamed out and then was silent marya kondrachevna explained as she ran running to the place where grigory lay the two women with the help of foma carried him to the lodge they lighted a candle and saw that smerdyakov was no better that he was writhing in convulsions his eyes fixed in a squint and that foam was flowing from his lips they moistened grigory's forehead with water mixed with vinegar and the water revived him at once he asked immediately is the master murdered then foma and both the women ran to the house and saw this time that not only the window but also the door into the garden was wide open though fyodor pavlovitch had for the last week locked himself in every night and did not allow even grigory to come in on any pretext seeing that door open they were afraid to go in to fyodor pavlovitch for fear anything should happen afterwards and when they returned to grigory the old man told them to go straight to the police captain marya kondrachevna ran there and gave the alarm to the whole party at the police captain's she arrived only five minutes before pyotr ilyitch so that his story came not as his own surmise and theory but as the direct confirmation by a witness of the theory held by all as to the identity of the criminal a theory he had in the bottom of his heart refused to believe till that moment it was resolved to act with energy the deputy police inspector of the town was commissioned to take four witnesses to enter fyodor pavlovitch's house and there to open an inquiry on the spot according to the regular forms which i will not go into here the district doctor a zealous man new to his work almost insisted on accompanying the police captain the prosecutor and the investigating lawyer i will note briefly that fyodor pavlovitch was found to be quite dead with his skull battered in but with what most likely with the same weapon with which grigory had been attacked and immediately that weapon was found grigory to whom all possible medical assistance was at once given described in a weak and breaking voice how he had been knocked down they began looking with a lantern by the fence and found the brass pestle dropped in a most conspicuous place on the garden path there were no signs of disturbance in the room where fyodor pavlovitch was lying but by the bed behind the screen they picked up from the floor a big and thick envelope with the inscription a present of three thousand roubles for my angel grushenka if she is willing to come and below had been added by fyodor pavlovitch for my little chicken there were three seals of red sealing wax on the envelope but it had been torn open and was empty the money had been removed they found also on the floor a piece of narrow pink ribbon with which the envelope had been tied up one piece of pyotr ilyitch's evidence made a great impression on the prosecutor and the investigating magistrate namely his idea that dmitri fyodorovitch would shoot himself before daybreak that he had resolved to do so had spoken of it to ilyitch had taken the pistols loaded them before him written a letter put it in his pocket etc when pyotr ilyitch though still unwilling to believe it threatened to tell some one so as to prevent the suicide mitya had answered grinning you'll be too late so they must make haste to Macro to find the criminal before he really did shoot himself that's clear that's clear repeated the prosecutor in great excitement that's just the way with mad fellows like that i shall kill myself to-morrow so i'll make merry till i die the story of how he had bought the wine and provisions excited the prosecutor more than ever do you remember the fellow that murdered a merchant called olsufyev gentlemen 
he stole fifteen hundred went at once to have his hair curled and then without even hiding the money carrying it almost in his hand in the same way he went off to the girls all were delayed however by the inquiry the search and the formalities etc in the house of fyodor pavlovitch it all took time and so two hours before starting they sent on ahead to mokro the officer of the rural police mavriki mavrikevitch Mirzov, who had arrived in the town the morning before to get his pay he was instructed to avoid raising the alarm when he reached mokro but to keep constant watch over the criminal till the arrival of the proper authorities to procure also witnesses for the arrest police constables and so on mavriki mavrikevitch did as he was told preserving his incognito and giving no one but his old acquaintance trifon borisovitch the slightest hint of his secret business he had spoken to him just before mitya met the landlord in the balcony looking for him in the dark and noticed at once a change in trifon borisovitch's face and voice so neither mitya nor anyone else knew that he was being watched the box with the pistols had been carried off by trifon borisovitch and put in a suitable place only after four o'clock almost at sunrise all the officials the police captain the prosecutor the investigating lawyer drove up in two carriages each drawn by three horses the doctor remained at fyodor pavlovitch's to make a post-mortem next day on the body but he was particularly interested in the condition of the servant smerdyakov such violent and protracted epileptic fits recurring continually for twenty-four hours are rarely to be met with and are of interest to science he declared enthusiastically to his companions and as they left they laughingly congratulated him on his find the prosecutor and the investigating lawyer distinctly remembered the doctor's saying that smerdyakov could not outlive the night after these long but i think necessary explanations we will return to that moment of our tale at which we broke off end of section fifty five Section fifty six of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book nine, chapter three. The sufferings of a soul, the first ordeal. And so Mitya sat looking wildly at the people round him, not understanding what was said to him. Suddenly he got up, flung up his hands, and shouted aloud i'm not guilty i'm not guilty of that blood i'm not guilty of my father's blood i meant to kill him but i'm not guilty not i but he had hardly said this before grushenka rushed from behind the curtain and flung herself at the police captain's feet it was my fault mine my wickedness she cried in a heart-rending voice bathed in tears stretching out her clasped hands towards them he did it through me I tortured him and drove him to it. I tortured that poor old man that's dead, too, in my wickedness, and brought him to this. It's my fault, mine first, mine most, my fault. Yes, it's your fault. You're the chief criminal, you fury, you harlot. You're the most to blame, shouted the police captain, threatening her with his hand. But he was quickly and resolutely suppressed. The prosecutor positively seized hold of him this is absolutely irregular mihail makarovitch he cried you are positively hindering the inquiry you're ruining the case he almost gasped follow the regular course follow the regular course cried nikolai parfenovitch fearfully excited too otherwise it's absolutely impossible judge us together grushenka cried frantically still kneeling punish us together i will go with him now if it's to death grusha my life my blood my holy one mitya fell on his knees beside her and held her tight in his arms don't believe her he cried she's not guilty of anything of any blood of anything 
he remembered afterwards that he was forcibly dragged away from her by several men and that she was led out and that when he recovered himself he was sitting at the table beside him and behind him stood the men with metal plates facing him on the other side of the table sat nikolai parfenovitch the investigating lawyer he kept persuading him to drink a little water out of a glass that stood on the table that will refresh you that will calm you be calm don't be frightened he added extremely politely mitya he remembered it afterwards became suddenly intensely interested in his big rings one with an amethyst and another with a transparent bright yellow stone of great brilliance and long afterwards he remembered with wonder how those rings had riveted his attention through all those terrible hours of interrogation so that he was utterly unable to tear himself away from them and dismiss them as things that had nothing to do with his position on mitch's left side in the place where maximov had been sitting at the beginning of the evening the prosecutor was now seated and on mitch's right hand where grushenka had been was a rosy-cheeked young man in a sort of shabby hunting jacket with ink and paper before him this was the secretary of the investigating lawyer who had brought him with him the police captain was now standing by the window at the other end of the room beside kalganov who was sitting there drink some water said the investigating lawyer softly for the tenth time i have drunk it gentlemen i have but come gentlemen crush me punish me decide my fate cried mitya staring with terribly fixed wide-open eyes at the investigating lawyer so you positively declare that you are not guilty of the death of your father fyodor pavlovitch asked the investigating lawyer softly but insistently i am not guilty i am guilty of the blood of another old man but not of my father's and i weep for it i killed i killed the old man and knocked him down but it's hard to have to answer for that murder with another a terrible murder of which i am not guilty it's a terrible accusation gentlemen a knock-down blow but who has killed my father who has killed him who can have killed him if i didn't it's marvellous extraordinary impossible yes who can have killed him the investigating lawyer was beginning but ippolit kirillovitch the prosecutor glancing at him addressed mitya you need not worry yourself about the old servant grigory vassilievitch he is alive he has recovered and in spite of the terrible blows inflicted according to his own and your evidence by you there seems no doubt that he will live so the doctor says at least alive he's alive cried mitya flinging up his hands his face beamed lord i thank thee for the miracle thou hast wrought for me a sinner and evil-doer that's an answer to my prayer i've been praying all night and he crossed himself three times he was almost breathless so from this grigory we have received such important evidence concerning you that the prosecutor would have continued but mitya suddenly jumped up from his chair one minute gentlemen for god's sake one minute i will run to her excuse me at this moment it's quite impossible nikolai perfenovitch almost shrieked he too leapt to his feet mitya was seized by the men with the metal plates but he sat down of his own accord gentlemen what a pity i wanted to see her for one minute only i wanted to tell her that it has been washed away it has gone that blood that was weighing on my heart all night and that i am not a murderer now gentlemen she is my betrothed he said ecstatically and reverently looking round at them all oh thank you gentlemen oh in one minute you have given me new life new heart that old man used to carry me in his arms gentlemen he used to wash me in the tub when i was a baby three years old abandoned by every one he was like a father to me and so you the investigating lawyer began allow me gentlemen allow me one minute more interposed mitya putting his elbows on the table and covering his face with his hands 
let me have a moment to think let me breathe gentlemen all this is horribly upsetting horribly a man is not a drum gentlemen drink a little more water murmured nikolai parfenovitch mitya took his hands from his face and laughed his eyes were confident he seemed completely transformed in a moment his whole bearing was changed he was once more the equal of these men with all of whom he was acquainted as though they had all met the day before when nothing had happened at some social gathering we may note in passing that on his first arrival mitya had been made very welcome at the police captain's but later during the last month especially mitya had hardly called at all and when the police captain met him in the street for instance mitya noticed that he frowned and only bowed out of politeness his acquaintance with the prosecutor was less intimate though he sometimes paid his wife a nervous and fanciful lady visits of politeness without quite knowing why and she always received him graciously and had for some reason taken an interest in him up to the last he had not had time to get to know the investigating lawyer though he had met him and talked to him twice each time about the fair sex you're a most skilful lawyer i see nikolai parfenovitch cried mitya laughing gaily but i can help you now oh gentlemen i feel like a new man and don't be offended at my addressing you so simply and directly i'm rather drunk too i'll tell you that frankly i believe i've had the honour and pleasure of meeting you nikolai parfenovitch at my kinsman musov's gentlemen gentlemen i don't pretend to be on equal terms with you i understand of course in what character i am sitting before you oh of course there's a horrible suspicion hanging over me if grigory has given evidence a horrible suspicion it's awful awful i understand that but to business gentlemen i am ready and we will make an end of it in one moment for listen listen gentlemen since i know i'm innocent we can put an end to it in a minute can't we can't we mitya spoke much and quickly nervously and effusively as though he positively took his listeners to be his best friends so for the present we will write that you absolutely deny the charge brought against you said nikolai parfenovitch impressively and bending down to the secretary he dictated to him in an undertone what to write write it down you want to write that down well write it i consent i give my full consent gentlemen only do you see stay stay write this of disorderly conduct i am guilty of violence on a poor old man i am guilty and there is something else at the bottom of my heart of which i am guilty too but that you need not write down he turned suddenly to the secretary that's my personal life gentlemen that doesn't concern you the bottom of my heart that's to say but of the murder of my old father i'm not guilty that's a wild idea it's quite a wild idea i will prove you that and you'll be convinced directly you will laugh gentlemen you'll laugh yourselves at your suspicion be calm dmitri fyodorovitch said the investigating lawyer evidently trying to allay mitya's excitement by his own composure before we go on with our inquiry i should like if you will consent to answer to hear you confirm the statement that you disliked your father fyodor pavlovitch that you were involved in continual disputes with him here at least a quarter of an hour ago you exclaimed that you wanted to kill him i didn't kill him you said but i wanted to kill him did i exclaim that Ugh, that may be so gentlemen yes unhappily i did want to kill him many times i wanted to unhappily unhappily you wanted to would you consent to explain what motives precisely led you to such a sentiment of hatred for your parent what is there to explain gentlemen mitya shrugged his shoulders sullenly looking down i have never concealed my feelings all the town knows about it everyone knows in the tavern 
only lately i declared them in father zosima's cell and the very same day in the evening i beat my father i nearly killed him and i swore i'd come again and kill him before witnesses oh a thousand witnesses i've been shouting it aloud for the last month anyone can tell you that the fact stares you in the face it speaks for itself it cries aloud but feelings gentlemen feelings are another matter you see gentlemen mitya frowned it seems to me that about feelings you've no right to question me i know that you are bound by your office i quite understand that but that's my affair my private intimate affair yet since i haven't concealed my feelings in the past in the tavern for instance i've talked to everyone so so i won't make a secret of it now you see i understand gentlemen that there are terrible facts against me in this business i told everyone that i'd kill him and now all of a sudden he's been killed so it must have been me <laughs> i can make allowances for you gentlemen i can quite make allowances i'm struck all of a heap myself for who can have murdered him if not i that's what it comes to isn't it if not i who can it be who gentlemen i want to know i insist on knowing he exclaimed suddenly where was he murdered how was he murdered how and with what tell me he asked quickly looking at the two lawyers we found him in his study lying on his back on the floor with his head battered in said the prosecutor that's horrible mitya shuddered and putting his elbows on the table hid his face in his right hand we will continue interposed nikolai parfenovitch so what was it that impelled you to this sentiment of hatred you have asserted in public i believe that it was based upon jealousy well yes jealousy and not only jealousy disputes about money yes about money too there was a dispute about three thousand roubles i think which you claimed as part of your inheritance three thousand more more cried mitya hotly more than six thousand more than ten perhaps i told everyone so shouted it at them but i made up my mind to let it go at three thousand i was desperately in need of that three thousand so the bundle of notes for three thousand that i knew he kept under his pillow ready for grushenka i considered as simply stolen from me yes gentlemen i looked upon it as mine as my own property the prosecutor looked significantly at the investigating lawyer and had time to wink at him on the sly we will return to that subject later said the lawyer promptly you will allow us to note that point and write it down that you looked upon that money as your own property write it down by all means i know that's another fact that tells against me but i'm not afraid of facts and i tell them against myself do you hear do you know gentlemen you take me for a different sort of man from what i am he added suddenly gloomy and dejected you have to deal with a man of honour a man of the highest honour above all don't lose sight of it a man who's done a lot of nasty things but has always been and still is honourable at bottom in his inner being i don't know how to express it that's just what's made me wretched all my life that i yearned to be honourable that i was so to say a martyr to a sense of honour seeking for it with a lantern with the lantern of diogenes and yet all my life i've been doing filthy things like all of us gentlemen that is like me alone that was a mistake like me alone me alone gentlemen my head aches his brows contracted with pain you see gentlemen i couldn't bear the look of him there was something in him ignoble impudent trampling on everything sacred something sneering and irreverent loathsome loathsome but now that he's dead i feel differently how do you mean i don't feel differently but i wish i hadn't hated him so you feel penitent 
no not penitent don't write that i'm not much good myself i'm not very beautiful so i had no right to consider him repulsive that's what i mean write that down if you like saying this mitchell became very mournful he had grown more and more gloomy as the inquiry continued at that moment another unexpected scene followed though grushenka had been removed she had not been taken far away only into the room next but one from the blue room in which the examination was proceeding it was a little room with one window next beyond the large room in which they had danced and feasted so lavishly she was sitting there with no one by her but maximov who was terribly depressed terribly scared and clung to her side as though for security at their door stood one of the peasants with a metal plate on his breast grushenka was crying and suddenly her grief was too much for her she jumped up flung up her arms and with a loud wail of sorrow rushed out of the room to him to her mitya and so unexpectedly that they had not time to stop her mitya hearing her cry trembled jumped up and with a yell rushed impetuously to meet her not knowing what he was doing but they were not allowed to come together though they saw one another he was seized by the arms he struggled and tried to tear himself away it took three or four men to hold him she was seized too and he saw her stretching out her arms to him crying aloud as they carried her away when the scene was over he came to himself again sitting in the same place as before opposite the investigating lawyer and crying out to them what do you want with her why do you torment her she's done nothing nothing the lawyers tried to soothe him about ten minutes passed like this at last mihail makarovitch who had been absent came hurriedly into the room and said in a loud and excited voice to the prosecutor she's been removed she's downstairs will you allow me to say one word to this unhappy man gentlemen in your presence gentlemen in your presence by all means mihail makarovitch answered the investigating lawyer in the present case we have nothing against it listen dmitri fyodorovitch my dear fellow began the police captain and there was a look of warm almost fatherly feeling for the luckless prisoner on his excited face i took your agrafena alexandrovna downstairs myself and confided her to the care of the landlord's daughters and that old fellow maximov is with her all the time and i soothed her do you hear i soothed and calmed her i impressed on her that you have to clear yourself so she mustn't hinder you must not depress you or you may lose your head and say the wrong thing in your evidence in fact i talked to her and she understood she's a sensible girl my boy a good-hearted girl she would have kissed my old hands begging help for you she sent me herself to tell you not to worry about her and i must go my dear fellow i must go and tell her that you are calm and comforted about her and so you must be calm do you understand i was unfair to her she is a christian soul gentlemen yes i tell you she's a gentle soul and not to blame for anything so what am i to tell her dmitri fyodorovitch will you sit quiet or not the good-natured police captain said a great deal that was irregular but grushenka's suffering a fellow creature's suffering touched his good-natured heart and tears stood in his eyes mitya jumped up and rushed towards him forgive me gentlemen oh allow me allow me he cried you've the heart of an angel an angel mihail makarovitch i thank you for her i will i will be calm cheerful in fact tell her in the kindness of your heart that i am cheerful quite cheerful that i shall be laughing in a minute knowing that she has a guardian angel like you i shall have done with all this directly and as soon as i'm free i'll be with her she'll see let her wait gentlemen he said turning to the two lawyers now i'll open my whole soul to you i'll pour out everything we'll finish this off directly finish it off gaily we shall laugh at it in the end shan't we 
but gentlemen that woman is the queen of my heart oh let me tell you that that one thing i'll tell you now i see i'm with honorable men she is my light she is my holy one and if only you knew did you hear her cry i'll go to death with you and what have i a penniless beggar done for her why such love for me how can a clumsy ugly brute like me with my ugly face deserve such love that she is ready to go to exile with me and how she fell down at your feet for my sake just now and yet she's proud and has done nothing how can i help adoring her how can i help crying out and rushing to her as i did just now gentlemen forgive me but now now i am comforted and he sank back in his chair and covering his face with his hands burst into tears but they were happy tears he recovered himself instantly the old police captain seemed much pleased and the lawyers also they felt that the examination was passing into a new phase when the police captain went out mitchell was positively gay now gentlemen i am at your disposal entirely at your disposal and if it were not for all these trivial details we should understand one another in a minute i am at those details again i am at your disposal gentlemen but i declare that we must have mutual confidence you in me and i in you or there'll be no end to it i speak in your interests to business gentlemen to business and don't rummage in my soul don't tease me with trifles but only ask me about facts and what matters and i will satisfy you at once and damn the details so spoke mitya the interrogation began again end of section 56section fifty seven of the brothers karamazov by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary book nine chapter four the second ordeal you don't know how you encourage us dmitri fyodorovitch by your readiness to answer said nikolai parfenovitch with an animated air and obvious satisfaction beaming in his very prominent short-sighted light gray eyes from which he had removed his spectacles a moment before and you have made a very just remark about the mutual confidence without which it is sometimes positively impossible to get on in cases of such importance if the suspected party really hopes and desires to defend himself and is in a position to do so we on our side will do everything in our power and you can see for yourself how we are conducting the case you approve ippolit kirillovitch he turned to the prosecutor oh undoubtedly replied the prosecutor his tone was somewhat cold compared with nikolai parfenovitch's impulsiveness i will note once for all that nikolai parfenovitch who had but lately arrived among us had from the first felt marked respect for ippolit kirillovitch our prosecutor and had become almost his bosom friend he was almost the only person who put implicit faith in ippolit kirillovitch's extraordinary talents as a psychologist and orator and in the justice of his grievance he had heard of him in petersburg on the other hand young nikolai parfenovitch was the only person in the whole world whom our unappreciated prosecutor genuinely liked on their way to makro they had time to come to an understanding about the present case and now as they sat at the table the sharp-witted junior caught and interpreted every indication on his senior colleague's face half a word a glance or a wink gentlemen only let me tell my own story and don't interrupt me with trivial questions and i'll tell you everything in a moment said mitya excitedly excellent thank you but before we proceed to listen to your communication will you allow me to inquire as to another little fact of great interest to us i mean the ten roubles you borrowed yesterday at about five o'clock on the security of your pistols from your friend pyotr ilyitch perhotin i pledged them gentlemen 
i pledged them for ten roubles what more that's all about it as soon as i got back to town i pledged them you got back to town then you had been out of town yes i went on a journey of forty firsts into the country didn't you know the prosecutor and nikolai parfenovitch exchanged glances well how would it be if you began your story with a systematic description of all you did yesterday from the morning onwards allow us for instance to inquire why you were absent from the town and just when you left and when you came back all those facts you should have asked me like that from the beginning cried mitya laughing aloud and if you like we won't begin from yesterday but from the morning of the day before then you'll understand how why and where i went i went the day before yesterday gentlemen to a merchant of the town called samsonov to borrow three thousand roubles from him on safe security it was a pressing matter gentlemen it was a sudden necessity allow me to interrupt you the prosecutor put in politely why were you in such pressing need for just that sum three thousand oh gentlemen you needn't go into details how when and why and why just so much money and not so much and all that rigmarole why it'll run to three volumes and then you'll want an epilogue mitya said all this with the good-natured but impatient familiarity of a man who is anxious to tell the whole truth and is full of the best intentions gentlemen he corrected himself hurriedly don't be vexed with me for my restiveness i beg you again believe me once more i feel the greatest respect for you and understand the true position of affairs don't think i'm drunk i'm quite sober now and besides being drunk would be no hindrance it's with me you know like the saying when he is sober he is a fool when he is drunk he is a wise man <laughs> but i see gentlemen it's not the proper thing to make jokes to you till we've had our explanation i mean and i've my own dignity to keep up too i quite understand the difference for the moment i am after all in the position of a criminal and so far from being on equal terms with you and it's your business to watch me i can't expect you to pat me on the head for what i did to grigory for one can't break old men's heads with impunity i suppose you'll put me away for him for six months or a year perhaps in a house of correction i don't know what the punishment is but it will be without loss of the rights of my rank without loss of my rank won't it so you see gentlemen i understand the distinction between us but you must see that you could puzzle god himself with such questions how did you step where did you step when did you step and on what did you step i shall get mixed up if you go on like this and you will put it all down against me and what will that lead to to nothing and even if it's nonsense i'm talking now let me finish and you gentlemen being men of honour and refinement will forgive me i'll finish by asking you gentlemen to drop that conventional method of questioning i mean beginning from some miserable trifle how i got up what i had for breakfast how i spat and where i spat and so distracting the attention of the criminal suddenly stun him with an overwhelming question whom did you murder whom did you rob <laughs> that's your regulation method that's where all your cunning comes in you can put peasants off their guard like that but not me i know the tricks i've been in the service too <laughs> you're not angry gentlemen you forgive my impertinence he cried looking at them with a good nature that was almost surprising it's only mitya karamazov you know so you can overlook it it would be inexcusable in a sensible man but you can forgive it in mitya <laughs> Nikolai Parfenovitch listened and laughed, too. Though the prosecutor did not laugh, he kept his eyes fixed keenly on Mitya, as though anxious not to miss the least syllable, the slightest movement, the smallest twitch of any feature of his face. "'That's how we have treated you from the beginning,' said Nikolai Parfenovitch, still laughing. "'We haven't tried to put you out by asking how you got up in the morning and what you had for breakfast.' we began indeed with questions of the greatest importance i understand i saw it and appreciated it and i appreciate still more your present kindness to me an unprecedented kindness worthy of your noble hearts 
we three here are gentlemen and let everything be on the footing of mutual confidence between educated well-bred people who have the common bond of noble birth and honour in any case allow me to look upon you as my best friends at this moment of my life at this moment when my honour is assailed that's no offence to you gentlemen is it on the contrary you've expressed all that so well dmitri fyodorovitch nikolai parfenovitch answered with dignified approbation and enough of those trivial questions gentlemen all those tricky questions cried mitya enthusiastically or there's simply no knowing where we shall get to is there i will follow your sensible advice entirely the prosecutor interposed addressing mitya i don't withdraw my question however it is now vitally important for us to know exactly why you needed that sum i mean precisely three thousand why i needed it oh for one thing and another well it was to pay a debt a debt to whom that i absolutely refuse to answer gentlemen not because i couldn't or because i shouldn't dare or because it would be damaging for it's all a paltry matter and absolutely trifling but i won't because it's a matter of principle that's my private life and i won't allow any intrusion into my private life that's my principle your question has no bearing on the case and whatever has nothing to do with the case is my private affair i wanted to pay a debt i wanted to pay a debt of honour but to whom i won't say allow me to make a note of that said the prosecutor by all means write down that i won't say that i won't write that i should think it dishonourable to say <laughs> you can write it you've nothing else to do with your time allow me to caution you sir and to remind you once more if you are unaware of it the prosecutor began with a peculiar and stern impressiveness that you have a perfect right not to answer the questions put to you now and we on our side have no right to extort an answer from you if you decline to give it for one reason or another that is entirely a matter for your personal decision but it is our duty on the other hand in such cases as the present to explain and set before you the degree of injury you will be doing yourself by refusing to give this or that piece of evidence after which i will beg you to continue gentlemen i'm not angry i mitya muttered in a rather disconcerted tone well gentlemen you see that samsonov to whom i went then we will of course not reproduce his account of what is known to the reader already mitya was impatiently anxious not to omit the slightest detail at the same time he was in a hurry to get it over but as he gave his evidence it was written down and therefore they had continually to pull him up mitya disliked this but submitted got angry though still good-humouredly he did it is true exclaim from time to time gentlemen that's enough to make an angel out of patience or gentlemen it's no good your irritating me but even though he exclaimed he still preserved for a time his genially expansive mood so he told them how samsonov had made a fool of him two days before he had completely realized by now that he had been fooled the sale of his watch for six roubles to obtain money for the journey was something new to the lawyers they were at once greatly interested and even to mitch's intense indignation thought it necessary to write the fact down as a secondary confirmation of the circumstance that he had hardly a farthing in his pocket at the time little by little mitya began to grow surly then after describing his journey to see Lyagavy, the night spent in the stifling hut and so on he came to his return to the town here he began without being particularly urged to give a minute account of the agonies of jealousy he endured on gushenka's account he was heard with silent attention they inquired particularly into the circumstance of his having a place of ambush in maria kondrachevna's house at the back of fyodor pavlovitch's garden to keep watch on grushenka and of smerdyakov's bringing him information 
they laid particular stress on this and noted it down of his jealousy he spoke warmly and at length and though inwardly ashamed at exposing his most intimate feelings to public ignominy so to speak he evidently overcame his shame in order to tell the truth the frigid severity with which the investigating lawyer and still more the prosecutor stared intently at him as he told his story disconcerted him at last considerably that boy nikolai parfenovitch to whom i was talking nonsense about women only a few days ago and that sickly prosecutor are not worth my telling this to he reflected mournfully it's ignominious be patient humble hold thy peace he wound up his reflections with that line but he pulled himself together to go on again when he came to telling of his visit to madame holikoff he regained his spirits and even wished to tell a little anecdote of that lady which had nothing to do with the case but the investigating lawyer stopped him and civilly suggested that he should pass on to more essential matters at last when he described his despair and told them how when he left madame holikoff's he thought that he'd get three thousand if he had to murder some one to do it they stopped him again and noted down that he had meant to murder some one mitya let them write it without protest at last he reached the point in his story when he learned that grushenka had deceived him and had returned from samsonov's as soon as he left her there though she had said that she would stay there till midnight if i didn't kill fenya then gentlemen it was only because i hadn't time broke from him suddenly at that point in his story that too was carefully written down mitya waited gloomily and was beginning to tell how he ran into his father's garden when the investigating lawyer suddenly stopped him and opening the big portfolio that lay on the sofa beside him he brought out the brass pestle do you recognize this object he asked showing it to mitya oh yes he laughed gloomily of course i recognize it let me have a look at it damn it never mind you have forgotten to mention it observed the investigating lawyer hang it all i shouldn't have concealed it from you do you suppose i could have managed without it it simply escaped my memory be so good as to tell us precisely how you came to arm yourself with it certainly i will be so good gentlemen and mitya described how he took the pestle and ran but what object had you in view in arming yourself with such a weapon what object no object i just picked it up and ran off what for if you had no object mitch's wrath flared up he looked intently at the boy and smiled gloomily and malignantly he was feeling more and more ashamed at having told such people the story of his jealousy so sincerely and spontaneously bother the pestle broke from him suddenly but still oh to keep off dogs oh, because it was dark in case anything turned up but have you ever on previous occasions taken a weapon with you when you went out since you're afraid of the dark Ugh, damn it all gentlemen there's positively no talking to you cried mitya exasperated beyond endurance and turning to the secretary crimson with anger he said quickly with a note of fury in his voice write down at once at once that i snatched up the pestle to go and kill my father fyodor pavlovitch by hitting him on the head with it well now are you satisfied gentlemen are your minds relieved he said glaring defiantly at the lawyers we quite understand that you made that statement just now through exasperation with us and the questions we put to you which you consider trivial though they are in fact essential the prosecutor remarked dryly in reply well upon my word gentlemen yes i took the pestle what does one pick things up for at such moments i don't know what for i snatched it up and ran that's all for to me gentlemen pass on or i declare i won't tell you any more he sat with his elbows on the table and his head in his hand 
he sat sideways to them and gazed at the wall struggling against a feeling of nausea he had in fact an awful inclination to get up and declare that he wouldn't say another word not if you hang me for it you see gentlemen he said at last with difficulty controlling himself you see i listen to you and am haunted by a dream it's a dream i have sometimes you know i often dream it it's always the same that someone is hunting me someone i'm awfully afraid of that he's hunting me in the dark in the night tracking me and i hide somewhere from him behind a door or cupboard hide in a degrading way and the worst of it is he always knows where i am but he pretends not to know where i am on purpose to prolong my agony to enjoy my terror that's just what you're doing now it's just like that is that the sort of thing you dream about inquired the prosecutor yes it is don't you want to write it down said mitya with a distorted smile no no need to write it down but still you do have curious dreams it's not a question of dreams now gentlemen this is realism this is real life i'm a wolf and you're the hunters well hunt him down you are wrong to make such comparisons began nikolai parfenovitch with extraordinary softness no i'm not wrong not at all mitya flared up again though his outburst of wrath had obviously relieved his heart he grew more good-humoured at every word you may not trust a criminal or a man on trial tortured by your questions but an honourable man the honourable impulses of the heart i say that boldly no that you must believe you have no right indeed but be silent heart be patient humble hold thy peace well shall i go on he broke off gloomily if you'll be so kind answered nikolai parfenovitch end of section fifty seven section fifty eight of the brothers karamazov by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary book nine chapter five the third ordeal though mitya spoke sullenly it was evident that he was trying more than ever not to forget or miss a single detail of his story he told them how he had leapt over the fence into his father's garden how he had gone up to the window told them all that had passed under the window clearly precisely distinctly he described the feelings that troubled him during those moments in the garden when he longed so terribly to know whether grushenka was with his father or not but strange to say both the lawyers listened now with a sort of awful reserve looked coldly at him asked few questions mitya could gather nothing from their faces they're angry and offended he thought well bother them when he described how he made up his mind at last to make the signal to his father that grushenka had come so that he should open the window the lawyers paid no attention to the word signal as though they entirely failed to grasp the meaning of the word in this connection so much so that mitya noticed it coming at last to the moment when seeing his father peering out of the window his hatred flared up and he pulled the pestle out of his pocket he suddenly as though of design stopped short he sat gazing at the wall and was aware that their eyes were fixed upon him well said the investigating lawyer you pulled out the weapon and and what happened then then why then i murdered him hit him on the head and cracked his skull i suppose that's your story that's it his eyes suddenly flashed all his smothered wrath suddenly flamed up with extraordinary violence in his soul our story repeated nikolai parfenovitch well and yours mitya dropped his eyes and was a long time silent my story gentlemen well it was like this he began softly whether it was someone's tears or my mother prayed to god or a good angel kissed me at that instant i don't know but the devil was conquered i rushed from the window and ran to the fence 
my father was alarmed and for the first time he saw me then cried out and sprang back from the window i remember that very well i ran across the garden to the fence and there grigory caught me when i was sitting on the fence at that point he raised his eyes at last and looked at his listeners they seemed to be staring at him with perfectly unruffled attention a sort of paroxysm of indignation seized on mitch's soul why you're laughing at me at this moment gentlemen he broke off suddenly what makes you think that observed nikolai parfenovitch you don't believe one word that's why i understand of course that i have come to the vital point the old man's lying there now with his skull broken while i after dramatically describing how i wanted to kill him and how i snatched up the pestle i suddenly ran away from the window a romance poetry as though one could believe a fellow on his word <laughs> you are scoffers gentlemen and he swung round on his chair so that it creaked and did you notice asked the prosecutor suddenly as though not observing mitch's excitement did you notice when you ran away from the window whether the door into the garden was open no it was not open it was not it was shut and who could open it bah the door wait a bit he seemed suddenly to bethink himself and almost with a start why did you find the door open yes it was open why who could have opened it if you did not open it yourselves cried mitya greatly astonished the door stood open and your father's murderer undoubtedly went in at that door and having accomplished the crime went out again by the same door the prosecutor pronounced deliberately as though chiseling out each word separately that is perfectly clear the murder was committed in the room and not through the window that is absolutely certain from the examination that has been made from the position of the body and everything there can be no doubt of that circumstance mitchell was absolutely dumbfounded but that's utterly impossible he cried completely at a loss i i didn't go in i tell you positively definitely the door was shut the whole time i was in the garden and when i ran out of the garden i only stood at the window and saw him through the window that's all that's all i remember to the last minute and if i didn't remember it would be just the same i know it for no one knew the signals except smerdyakov and me and the dead man and he wouldn't have opened the door to anyone in the world without the signals signals what signals asked the prosecutor with greedy almost hysterical curiosity he instantly lost all trace of his reserve and dignity he asked the question with a sort of cringing timidity he scented an important fact of which he had known nothing and was already filled with dread that mitya might be unwilling to disclose it so you didn't know mitya winked at him with a malicious and mocking smile what if i won't tell you from whom could you find out no one knew about the signals except my father smerdyakov and me that was all heaven knew too but it won't tell you but it's an interesting fact there's no knowing what you might build on it ha <laughs> ha take comfort gentlemen i'll reveal it you've some foolish idea in your hearts you don't know the man you have to deal with you have to do with a prisoner who gives evidence against himself to his own damage yes for i'm a man of honor and you are not the prosecutor swallowed this without a murmur he was trembling with impatience to hear the new fact minutely and diffusely mitya told them everything about the signals invented by fyodor pavlovitch for smerdyakov he told them exactly what every tap on the window meant tapped the signals on the table and when nikolai parfenovitch said that he supposed he mitya had tapped the signal grushenka has come when he tapped to his father he answered precisely that he had tapped that signal that grushenka had come so now you can build up your tower mitya broke off and again turned away from them contemptuously so no one knew of the signals but your dead father you and the valet smerdyakov and no one else nikolai parfenovitch inquired once more yes the valet smerdyakov and heaven 
write down about heaven that may be of use besides you will need god yourselves and they had already of course begun writing it down but while they wrote the prosecutor said suddenly as though pitching on a new idea but if smerdyakov also knew of these signals and you absolutely deny all responsibility for the death of your father was it not he perhaps who knocked the signal agreed upon induced your father to open to him and then committed the crime mitya turned upon him with a look of profound irony and intense hatred his silent stare lasted so long that it made the prosecutor blink you've caught the fox again commented mitya at last you've got the beast by the tail <laughs> i see through you mr prosecutor you thought of course that i should jump at that catch at your prompting and shout with all my might ay it's smerdyakov he's the murderer confess that's what you thought confess and i'll go on but the prosecutor did not confess he held his tongue and waited you're mistaken i'm not going to shout it's smerdyakov said mitya and you don't even suspect him why do you suspect him he is suspected too mitya fixed his eyes on the floor joking apart he brought out gloomily listen from the very beginning almost from the moment when i ran out to you from behind the curtain i've had the thought of smerdyakov in my mind i've been sitting here shouting that i'm innocent and thinking all the time smerdyakov I can't get Smerdyakov out of my head. In fact, I too thought of Smerdyakov just now, but only for a second. Almost at once I thought, no, it's not Smerdyakov. It's not his doing, gentlemen. In that case, is there anybody else you suspect? Nikolai Parfenovitch inquired cautiously. I don't know anyone it could be, whether it's in the hand of heaven or Satan, but not Smerdyakov mitya jerked out with decision but what makes you affirm so confidently and emphatically that it's not he from my conviction my impression because smerdyakov is a man of the most abject character and a coward he's not a coward he's the epitome of all the cowardice in the world walking on two legs he has the heart of a chicken when he talked to me he was always trembling for fear i should kill him though i never raised my hand against him he fell at my feet and blubbered he has kissed these very boots literally beseeching me not to frighten him do you hear not to frighten him what a thing to say why i offered him money he's a puling chicken sickly epileptic weak-minded a child of eight could thrash him he has no character worth talking about it's not smerdyakov gentlemen he doesn't care for money he wouldn't take my presents besides what motive had he for murdering the old man why he's very likely his son you know his natural son do you know that we have heard that legend but you are your father's son too you know yet you yourself told everyone you meant to murder him that's a thrust and a nasty mean one too i'm not afraid oh gentlemen isn't it too base of you to say that to my face it's base because i told you that myself i not only wanted to murder him but i might have done it and what's more i went out of my way to tell you of my own accord that i nearly murdered him but you see i didn't murder him you see my guardian angel saved me that's what you've not taken into account and that's why it's so base of you for i didn't kill him I didn't kill him do you hear i did not kill him he was almost choking he had not been so moved before during the whole interrogation and what has he told you gentlemen smerdyakov i mean he added suddenly after a pause may i ask that question you may ask any question the prosecutor replied with frigid severity any question relating to the facts of the case and we are i repeat bound to answer every inquiry you make we found the servant smerdyakov concerning whom you inquire lying unconscious in his bed in an epileptic fit of extreme severity that had recurred possibly ten times 
the doctor who was with us told us after seeing him that he may possibly not outlive the night well if that's so the devil must have killed him broke suddenly from mitya as though until that moment he had been asking himself was it smerdyakov or not we will come back to this later nikolai parfenovitch decided now wouldn't you like to continue your statement mitya asked for a rest his request was courteously granted after resting he went on with his story but he was evidently depressed he was exhausted mortified and morally shaken to make things worse the prosecutor exasperated him as though intentionally by vexatious interruptions about trifling points scarcely had mitya described how sitting on the wall he had struck grigory on the head with the pestle while the old man had hold of his left leg and how he had then jumped down to look at him when the prosecutor stopped him to ask him to describe exactly how he was sitting on the wall mitya was surprised how oh, i was sitting like this astride one leg on one side of the wall and one on the other and the pestle the pestle was in my hand not in your pocket do you remember that precisely was it a violent blow you gave him it must have been a violent one but why do you ask would you mind sitting on the chair just as you sat on the wall then and showing us just how you moved your arm and in what direction you're making fun of me aren't you asked mitya looking haughtily at the speaker but the latter did not flinch mitya turned abruptly sat astride on his chair and swung his arm this was how i struck him that's how i knocked him down what more do you want thank you may i trouble you now to explain why you jumped down with what object and what you had in view oh hang it i jumped down to look at the man i'd hurt i don't know what for though you were so excited and were running away yes though i was excited and running away you wanted to help him help yes perhaps i did want to help him i don't remember you don't remember then you didn't quite know what you were doing not at all i remember everything every detail i jumped down to look at him and wiped his face with my handkerchief we have seen your handkerchief did you hope to restore him to consciousness i don't know whether i hoped it i simply wanted to make sure whether he was alive or not ah you wanted to be sure well what then i'm not a doctor i couldn't decide i ran away thinking i'd killed him and now he's recovered excellent commented the prosecutor thank you that's all i wanted kindly proceed alas it never entered mitch's head to tell them though he remembered it that he had jumped back from pity and standing over the prostrate figure had even uttered some words of regret you've come to grief old man there's no help for it well there you must lie the prosecutor could only draw one conclusion that the man had jumped back at such a moment and in such excitement simply with the object of ascertaining whether the only witness of his crime were dead that he must therefore have been a man of great strength coolness decision and foresight even at such a moment and so on the prosecutor was satisfied i've provoked the nervous fellow by trifles and he has said more than he meant to with painful effort mitya went on but this time he was pulled up immediately by nikolai parfenovitch how came you to run to the servant fedosia markovna with your hands so covered with blood and as it appears your face too why i didn't notice the blood at all at the time answered mitya that's quite likely it does happen sometimes the prosecutor exchanged glances with nikolai parfenovitch i simply didn't notice you're quite right there prosecutor mitya assented suddenly next came the account of mitya's sudden determination to step aside and make way for their happiness but he could not make up his mind to open his heart to them as before and tell them about the queen of his soul he disliked speaking of her before these chilly persons who were fastening on him like bugs 
and so in response to their reiterated questions he answered briefly and abruptly well i made up my mind to kill myself what had i left to live for that question stared me in the face her first rightful lover had come back the man who wronged her but who'd hurried back to offer his love after five years and atone for the wrong with marriage so i knew it was all over for me and behind me disgrace and that blood grigories what had i to live for so i went to redeem the pistols i had pledged to load them and put a bullet in my brain to-morrow and a grand feast the night before yes a grand feast the night before damn it all gentlemen do make haste and finish it i meant to shoot myself not far from here beyond the village and i'd planned to do it at five o'clock in the morning and i had a note in my pocket already i wrote it at perhotin's when i loaded my pistols here's the letter read it it's not for you i tell it he added contemptuously he took it from his waistcoat pocket and flung it on the table the lawyers read it with curiosity and as is usual added it to the papers connected with the case and you didn't even think of washing your hands at per houghton's you were not afraid then of arousing suspicion what suspicion suspicion or not i should have galloped here just the same and shot myself at five o'clock and you wouldn't have been in time to do anything if it hadn't been for what's happened to my father you would have known nothing about it and wouldn't have come here oh it's the devil's doing it was the devil murdered father it was through the devil that you found it out so soon how did you manage to get here so quick it's marvellous a dream mr perhotin informed us that when you came to him you held in your hands your blood-stained hands your money a lot of money a bundle of hundred rouble notes and that his servant boy saw it too that's true gentlemen i remember it was so now there's one little point presents itself can you inform us nikolai parfenovitch began with extreme gentleness where did you get so much money all of a sudden when it appears from the facts from the reckoning of time that you had not been home the prosecutor's brows contracted at the question being asked so plainly but he did not interrupt nikolai parfenovitch no i didn't go home answered mitya apparently perfectly composed but looking at the floor allow me then to repeat my question nikolai parfenovitch went on as though creeping up to the subject where were you able to procure such a sum all at once when by your own confession at five o'clock the same day you i was in want of ten roubles and pledged my pistols with perhotin and then went to madame holikoff to borrow three thousand which she wouldn't give me and so on and all the rest of it mitya interrupted sharply yes gentlemen i was in want of it and suddenly thousands turned up eh do you know gentlemen you're both afraid now what if he won't tell us where he got it that's just how it is i'm not going to tell you gentlemen you've guessed right you'll never know said mitya chipping out each word with extraordinary determination the lawyers were silent for a moment you must understand mr karamazov that it is of vital importance for us to know said nikolai parfenovitch softly and suavely i understand but still i won't tell you the prosecutor too intervened and again reminded the prisoner that he was at liberty to refuse to answer questions if he thought it to his interest and so on but in view of the damage he might do himself by his silence especially in a case of such importance as and so on gentlemen and so on enough i've heard that rigmarole before mitya interrupted again i can see for myself how important it is and that this is the vital point and still i won't say what is it to us it's not our business but yours you are doing yourself harm observed nikolai parfenovitch nervously you see gentlemen joking apart mitya lifted his eyes and looked firmly at them both i had an inkling from the first that we should come to loggerheads at this point but at first when i began to give my evidence it was all still far away and misty it was all floating 
and i was so simple that i began with the supposition of mutual confidence existing between us now i can see for myself that such confidence is out of the question for in any case we were bound to come to this cursed stumbling-block and now we've come to it it's impossible and there's an end of it but i don't blame you you can't believe it all simply on my word i understand that of course he relapsed into gloomy silence couldn't you without abandoning your resolution to be silent about the chief point could you not at the same time give us some slight hint as to the nature of the motives which are strong enough to induce you to refuse to answer at a crisis so full of danger to you mitya smiled mournfully almost dreamily i'm much more good-natured than you think gentlemen i'll tell you the reason why and give you that hint though you don't deserve it i won't speak of that gentlemen because it would be a stain on my honour the answer to the question where i got the money would expose me to far greater disgrace than the murder and robbing of my father if i had murdered and robbed him that's why i can't tell you i can't for fear of disgrace what gentlemen are you going to write that down yes we'll write it down lisped nikolai parfenovitch you ought not to write that down about disgrace i only told you that in the goodness of my heart i needn't have told you i made you a present of it so to speak and you pounce upon it at once oh well write write what you like he concluded with scornful disgust i'm not afraid of you and i can still hold up my head before you and can't you tell us the nature of that disgrace nikolai parfenovitch hazarded the prosecutor frowned darkly no no c'est fini don't trouble yourselves it's not worth while soiling one's hands i have soiled myself enough through you as it is you're not worth it no one is enough gentlemen i'm not going on this was said to peremptorily nikolai parfenovitch did not insist further but from Ippolit Kirillovitch's eyes he saw that he had not given up hope. "'Can you not at least tell us what sum you had in your hands when you went into Mr. Perholton's? How many roubles, exactly?' "'I can't tell you that. You spoke to Mr. Perholton, I believe, of having received three thousand from Madame Holikoff? "'Perhaps I did. Enough, gentlemen. I won't say how much I had.' will you be so good then as to tell us how you came here and what you have done since you arrived oh you might ask the people here about that but i'll tell you if you like he proceeded to do so but we won't repeat his story he told it dryly and curtly of the raptures of his love he said nothing but told them that he abandoned his determination to shoot himself owing to new factors in the case he told the story without going into motives or details and this time the lawyers did not worry him much it was obvious that there was no essential point of interest to them here we shall verify all that we will come back to it during the examination of the witnesses which will of course take place in your presence said nikolai parfenovitch in conclusion and now allow me to request you to lay on the table everything in your possession especially all the money you still have about you my money gentlemen certainly i understand that that is necessary i am surprised indeed that you haven't inquired about it before it's true i couldn't get away anywhere i'm sitting here where i can be seen but here's my money count it take it that's all i think he turned it all out of his pockets even the small change two pieces of twenty kopecks he pulled out of his waistcoat pocket they counted the money which amounted to eight hundred and thirty-six roubles and forty kopecks and is that all asked the investigating lawyer yes you stated just now in your evidence that you spent three hundred roubles at plotnikoff's you gave perhoten ten your driver twenty here you lost two hundred then nikolai parfenovitch reckoned it all up mitya helped him readily they recollected every farthing and included it in the reckoning nikolai parfenovitch hurriedly added up the total 
with this eight hundred you must have had about fifteen hundred at first i suppose so snapped mitya how is it they all assert there was much more let them assert it but you asserted it yourself yes i did too we will compare all this with the evidence of other persons not yet examined don't be anxious about your money it will be properly taken care of and be at your disposal at the conclusion of what is beginning if it appears or so to speak is proved that you have undisputed right to it well and now nikolai parfenovitch suddenly got up and informed mitya firmly that it was his duty and obligation to conduct a minute and thorough search of your clothes and everything else by all means gentlemen i'll turn out all my pockets if you like and he did in fact begin turning out his pockets it will be necessary to take off your clothes too what undress Ugh, damn it won't you search me as i am can't you it's utterly impossible dmitri fyodorovitch you must take off your clothes as you like mitya submitted gloomily only please not here but behind the curtains who will search them behind the curtains of course nikolai parfenovitch bent his head in assent his small face wore an expression of peculiar solemnity end of section fifty eight